Good morning. My name is Dave Larley and I'm the uh, vicar here at All Saints Dallas. And it's a real honor to be with you here today. Uh, our passage is taken from um, the letter of James, chapter 5. And our subject matter today is the topic of prayer, the prayer of faith. So let me read our passage and we'll go from there. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, since we're talking about prayer, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the, this day. Thank you for this invitation for all of us to learn something more of what it means to call on your name and to pray. Would you bless everyone under the sound of my voice? That, they, that you would strengthen their hearts and their confidence as they come to you in prayer. In Christ's name, amen. Well, if you have your Bible still open or if you've closed them, if you're on a device, feel free to scroll back to James chapter 5. We're going to look through uh, just these, fir these uh, few five verses, and uh, I'll make a few notes along the way. And if you have the Bible, your Bible in front of you, it'll help you, you know, uh, stay awake and uh, you know, clock and track what I'm saying. So if you look at verse 13, it starts with these questions. Is anyone suffering? Let him pray. Is there anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is any among you sick? It's, a, it's quite striking, isn't it? The way he addresses these three people, the suffering, the cheerful, and the sick. And that's because the Christian community is unlike any other community on earth. Because as you know today, in your community, in my community, there are people who are suffering. They're having a horrible time. They're going through a real trial. There are also those who are on top of the world, who have just maybe welcomed a new baby, um, into this world or who are just cheering uh, for some reason. And then the third group are those who are sick. And what's so striking here is the invitation of Jesus, which is to invite all three together into community. And by inviting us together, he's really asking us to do something that people naturally never want to do. If you're suffering, the last thing you really want to do or have energy for is cheering somebody on who's doing really well. And if you're in that place of joy, the last thing you really want to do is uh, step into that place of suffering or into someone's sickness. This isn't something that comes naturally. But the reason it's possible is because of Jesus. And because of how Jesus changes our hearts to be more like his, it's, Jesus is the only one who can really put compassion into our hearts. And it's also because of the power of the Holy Spirit, which gives us what we need to put others first and consider others more highly than ourselves. So that's the community James is writing to. It's a considerate community. Now, these are tough times. There are all kinds of opinions right now about COVID-19, about politics, and the great invitation here is to consider others before we consider ourselves. It's to seek to understand 
and hear before we ourselves seek to be heard. This is the shape and the normative pattern of Christian community. And this is the place where the power of God resides. If you are today asking, seeking the Lord for more power, don't be surprised if what he begins to draw your attention to is to others and to start to consider others and the needs of others as highly as your own. So if you're suffering today, you're going through a real trial, maybe you've lost your job, maybe uh, a loved one is going through the end of a relationship, or you maybe you've been recently bereaved, you're in good company. If you're celebrating and you're cheerful, you're in good company. And if you're sick, you're in good company. Why? Because Jesus is here. He is with us and he's looking to move through us. It's interesting, isn't it, what the encouragement is for each of these groups. So if you're suffering, what are you to do? Pray. If you're going through a trial, what you need, the invitation of prayer, is a very close, intimate relationship with Jesus. When we suffer, God draws near. If you're cheerful, you're to sing. Sing praises. At any given moment, when we gather together and we worship together, there are some who are able to just sing for all, all they have. And that expectation isn't on those going through a trial, which is so encouraging. Because church is meant to be a place where you can come as you are. The other thing is, what if you're sick, are you expected to sing and sing your heart out? Well, you're welcome to, but no. Are you meant to pray and put all your effort into praying? No. What are you encouraged to do? Ask for help. Call for the elders. So look down with me at verse 14. Call for the elders. Who were the elders? Well, were they the old people in the church? No, it's not the elderly. It's the elders, though I, I love calling the elderly. Um, the elders of the church were the leaders. They're the pastors. Those who are known for their wisdom, those who are known for their maturity, and those who have a track record with God. They're maybe a little bit further down the road in their faith than perhaps the sick person is. So that if you're sick, you're to call for the elders, and as they pray, they anoint with oil. Now, do you always need oil when you pray? No. Sometimes it can be unleaded. It's absolutely fine. But like anything, oil is a symbol, and symbols can be helpful. Well, what does the anointing with oil represent? You know, it represents the healing power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you got to be careful in Dallas. I'm sure where you are too. Um, when people anoint with oil, we kind of do it sparingly. You don't really want to mess up anyone's foundation or hair uh, or anything else going on. You want to get it in their beard if they're bearded. And so we kind of do a little bit, you know, in the sign of a cross. And that's okay. I've been to other churches where they're a bit excessive with the oil and you end up having a, a kind of a... a, a oil facial as it were where it just kind of is coming all down your face and um, you know the first time that happens for me it was all, the first time was also the last time it's quite striking because oh, I'm covered in oil but you know it was a really powerful symbol of being covered in the spirit of God uh, truth be told when that happened to me at a prayer time that person's hand just slipped um, but the, 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 the oil is a sign, a powerful sign. And it's a symbol representing to us the healing power of the Holy Spirit to come upon the sick person. And they do it in the name of the Lord. And this is really important because it's a sign to us as well that it's God, not the oil, that heals. So this isn't magic. It's a sign that helps us and points us to the presence and power of God. Look down with me at verse 15. 
In verse 15, we read, um, where am I here? Oh, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Another big surprise here. The great encouragement here is that it is not the faith of the sick person. The sick person isn't, is not the focus. The, so if you're sick today and you are calling for prayer, the burden of faith is not on you. It's on the people praying. One of the most harmful things people in church can say is you need to have more faith. Well, Jesus never said that. And James isn't saying it here. And the people who say that are actually um, trying to, you know, pass the buck and say, well, the reason why you, uh, you weren't healed isn't my fault. It's actually your fault because you're not good enough. Well, that's not what Jesus says. Remember, the church is a place where people can come. You can come as you are. Let your mask down. If you're having a horrific day, that's okay. Let it show. If you're having a great day, let it show. All are welcome. And when we pray in faith, the faith is of the person praying. That's why on our prayer ministry team, I'm sure like yours, we ask pe the people who are wise and mature to pray. So hopefully we can avoid those kind of statements. James makes it clear that there isn't a requirement on the sick person to exercise any faith, only that they can call for help. You know, the one thing that I've seen in this line of work is that Christians who are sick, when I've been sick, it's hard to pray. It's hard to, it's hard to call out and to believe that God would want to heal me because the pain and the isolation is just so close. And that's why the good news here of the gospel is that if you're sick, you don't need to worry about praying. That's why you're in community. The community is meant to be there for you, to lift you up. My wife and I went through uh, a difficult time last October where um, I got home uh, one afternoon and I found my wife Rachel in the kitchen, bent over double on the floor with severe abdominal pain. Luckily, our sitter had just arrived. We were meant to be going out to a church function. So the sitter took over, looking after our two boys, our three boys, and uh, I rushed Rachel to uh, the hospital. And uh, we found out that she had an ectopic pregnancy. That's where the pregnancy develops in the fallopian tube. And uh, it just kept going from bad to worse. Now, I, I, let me be clear, you know, Rachel was in pain. What I was doing is, you know, as her husband going through it with her, and I didn't know how to pray. And I'm paid to pray, right? I'm a priest, I'm a pastor. I've been leading people in churches for 17 years. And my experience of that emotional pain and that distress for my wife meant I lost all my words. But my thumbs worked. I could text, and I texted friends, and suddenly they began to pray, and things began to change. Uh, Rachel had to be uh, at one point rushed for emergency surgery, and uh, a dear friend of mine, Larry, came and sat with me in the waiting room of the hospital, and I was given regular updates as the procedure went on, and and things got bad at one point where um, you know Rachel almost lost her life. And I just couldn't pray. And thank God for Larry. And I thank God for his faith because his prayer of faith sustained me. And Rachel pulled through and I am so thankful to God that we have community. And that's the big thing is that the prayer of faith rests on the shoulders of community, not on the individual, not on the one going through trial and not on the one who is sick. What's so, it's also striking here in verse 15 is um, the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick. Will save. Um, and there's a double meaning there. Remember when Jesus went about his gospel mission, he preached the good news of forgiveness and of sin 
and he demonstrated it in power through signs and wonders. And there's a sense here of that double meaning. The first meaning is that the sick person will be physically healed. Um, last week, I was finishing up here at the office and I heard from a friend of mine, a good friend of mine who likes to bike. He's a cyclist like me. Well, I'm an aspiring cyclist and he'd had an accident. He can't remember what happened. He just knows that he blacked out. And when he came to, praise God, a trauma doctor was looking over him and they checked him out and he, he got home. But because he, he hit the back of his head and suffered a concussion, he also hit his shoulder. And this is as high as he could raise his shoulder. So I went around and I had my mask on, I had sanitized my hands, you know, and I was trying not to get too close to him and his wife. And how do you pray? What does a prayer of faith look like? Well, I just uh, got a little close and I put my hand on his shoulder, having sanitized the hand. and um, I said, Lord Jesus, in your name, I ask for healing on Hunter. And you know what happened? Uh, nothing. <laughs> it, just, it was just like, ah, do I say anything? You know, we kind of prayed a little longer and I just waited and I wanted to ask. And so I said, Hunter, how do you feel? And he was like, I don't know. I said, well, try it out. And he went, and he stopped there. And he's like, I think I can go higher. And then all of a sudden, he had regained most of the motion in his shoulder. And then over the next 24 hours, he'd regained full movement. And I saw him um, in the park, it was his son's birthday and we bumped into him and he said, you won't believe it, but my shoulder is perfectly fine. And he said, the Lord healed it. And then his wife, who was also there, came up to me and said, Dave, you won't believe this. And I said, oh, try me. She said, I've been suffering um, from vertigo for the last year after a, a concussion. And um, we didn't even pray for me on Sunday. But the moment you prayed for my husband, I felt the Holy Spirit come upon me and I haven't suffered from vertigo since. So, you know, when we don't pray for healing, nobody gets healed. And it's a mystery. But when we do pray for healing, sometimes God heals. We don't know why he doesn't, but we just know that we are called to draw near to the sick and to pray for them. Well, the second meaning is that the sick person may also experience spiritual salvation, which means that they will have an encounter of the love of God, and that encounter by the Spirit of God will lead them to put their trust in Jesus. And um, some time ago, I was on my way to preach on healing at church in London, where um, uh, I, uh, we were living, and I was walking to church, and I saw this woman limping up towards me, coming towards me, and I thought, Lord, do you want me to pray for her for healing? Uh, the timing is, is, you know, I might be late for church, but anyway, and I walked right past her. And then I thought, oh, come on, Dave, pull yourself together. And I turned around and I followed her back up uh, the hill. And I thought, this is going to be so weird approaching her from behind. And so I went past her again. And uh, then I turned around and she disappeared. Uh, she'd gone into the grocery store. So I run into the grocery store and I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. It's 7.30 in the morning. There's no one there. And then suddenly by the hamburger, I see her and I say, there you are. <laughs> and she was startled, uh, shocked even. And uh, I said, I saw you walking up to the, uh, the grocery store. And, uh, my name's Dave and I'm a pastor of the church down the road that you passed on the way up. And I'm going to be speaking on healing. And I wondered if I could pray for your healing. And she looked a little surprised and said, sure, you could pray for me. And I thought God had given me a word of knowledge. And so uh, I said, and, and I have a sense that I, God wants you to pray for your hip. And she said, oh, my hip's fine. And I said, but you have a limp. I said, oh yeah, I had my leg amputated some time ago and I have a new prosthetic and it doesn't fit properly. I was like, oh, well, let's pray anyway. And I, I really, I was kind of, I realized I was in over my head. So I just said, can I, you know, touch your shoulder? And I put my hands up by the hamburger aisle. Meanwhile, one of the grocery store tenants kind of looking at us like, this isn't normal. What's going on here? But I get that a lot. And so I just said, Lord Jesus, her name was Heidi. Come and fill Heidi with your spirit and heal her 
In Jesus' name, amen. When I'm out in public, my prayers, I try to keep them to seven seconds, especially if I'm praying with a, someone who doesn't know Jesus yet. And when after that five seconds, seven seconds went by, I opened my eyes, and Heidi is bawling. I kind of looked at her leg to see, you know, I thought if the leg grew back, you know, with the prosthetic be on the floor. But anyway, none of that happened. She was just crying. And I said, what happened? And she said, I grew up in Northern Ireland where people have been killing each other over the name of religion my whole life. And when you prayed for me, love like I've never experienced entered my heart. And I know that Jesus loves me now. And I never knew that before. And she, she hugged me and I prayed for her again and we had this most incredible moment. I had prayed for her leg to be healed, which would have been awesome. I mean, I've heard of stories of those things happening, but I think a greater miracle happened, and this is the point. The greater miracle that happened is that she met Jesus, and she came to faith in him, and she, um, she just was absolutely transformed and still has a prosthetic leg, but she knows Jesus. Remember, Jesus healed both physically and spiritually, and the same double expectation is here as well. Um, when I see a sick person, I always try to pray and I, you know, uh, and offer it. Not, they don't, people don't always accept it, and that's okay. Our role is to represent Jesus, to pray, and leave everything else up to him. I was invited um, to speak on power evangelism last December at a seminary, and we were doing uh, street evangelism, so I took all the seminarians out every afternoon to uh, show them how it was done and to model it with them. And we're on the, uh, the main street, and there's a lot of pedestrian traffic because the roads are closed. And um, This woman approached uh, me, and we were talking, and she said, you're spiritual, aren't you? I said, well, yes, yes, I am. I was there with my friend Greg. And um, she said, I was uh, reading my horoscope this morning and told me that I would have a uh, spiritual conversation that would keep me from doing my work. And I said, that's absolutely right. This is that conversation. And we had an hour-long conversation about Jesus, faith, the new age, all that kind of stuff. And at the end of it, we said, would you like us to pray for you? And we just said, come Holy Spirit. And she was filled. You could see it. It's like lightning hit her. Her eyes went out. She was like, who was that? And I said, that's Jesus introducing himself to you, making himself known. And she said, that's not like anything I've ever experienced. And we led her uh, into a simple uh, prayer of faith and she became a follower of Jesus. Lack of faith on part of the sick person is not the reason that the sick person isn't healed. Most people that I have prayed for um, who I've seen God do incredible things, they've had enough faith to ask for help. And that's all the faith you need is simply to receive. So don't let anyone tell you that your lack of faith prevented you from being healed because it's does, it doesn't line up with the Bible, and if it doesn't line up with the truth, what's the word for that? Yeah, a lie. We had this thing happen uh, on a similar topic here at the church a year ago before we moved, and we moved from Oaklawn to downtown where we are now, where I'm speaking to you from, and um, it was a prophetic word that someone had, and it was like this. We feel that there's someone in the congregation wearing sparkly shoes. <laughs> People start to snicker, because it's kind of a funny thing to say. Who's wearing sparkly shoes? Well, it's Dallas, right? So there's like, everything's bedazzled to some extent. Um, and the word was, and you feel like you've never been in the spotlight of God's attention, you've always been in the background, but God is pulling it, you into the very focus of his love. Well, eight people happened to be wearing sparkly shoes that day. In fact, someone came in, was just set kind of over in that direction, and on the way out, she handed me her journal. 
And she said, I don't understand what just happened. I said, oh, tell me about it. This is what I've journaled all week. I'm always in the background. I'm never in the center. And I feel like I'm never in the center of God's love. My dog chewed through all my shoes except for these sparkly ones. I don't really believe in modern day prophecy, but you just prophesied over me. <laughs> I was like, that's just God letting you know that he loves you and he's with you and he loves you. Another woman came up and then a man came up and he had just had his boots polished and they sparkled. He says, does this count? I said, absolutely. And we prayed for him and he just started to sob. Um, and he was a very successful businessman, still is, but it never really, he understood up here that God loved him, but didn't know here that God loved him. And he used sparkly boots or shoes to convey it. Well, our accountant went to lunch that day and he was having lunch with a friend of his from Oklahoma. And uh, they were talking about what happened in church that day. And he knocked his fork off the table by accident. He's picking it up and he sees that this 80 year old friend of his, of his is wearing sparkly shoes. And he says, do you mind if I encourage you with something? She's like, absolutely. And he gives her the word. And she starts to cry and she says, since my husband died, he'd been a preacher and he was always at the very center of things. And now that he's died and I've been here this last year, I've always felt I'm on the periphery. And they pray and she realizes that God loves her and that even though she's felt like she's on the periphery of things, God is calling her back. And every time we updated the story, people wearing sparkly shoes uh, would respond. We had this five-year-old girl whose parents had just gone through a very difficult divorce. And uh, she ran up to me three weeks afterwards and she said, look what I'm wearing. And she had sparkly shoes on. And uh, I said, yeah. And she said, you know, someone said that the sparkly shoes was a sign that God loves them. And is that word for me? I said, yeah, absolutely. And her mother came over and I knelt down beside her and I said, can we pray for you? And we did and, you know, invited the Holy Spirit to come upon her and she just started to giggle. I love it because it was so pure. And I said, what, how do you feel? She says, I feel bubbly inside and Jesus, He's tickled my heart. Well, that was just a powerful sign of the work of God in her. And, you know, was that physical healing? No, but it was the healing of the soul. So I encourage you, all you need, if you are sick, all you need to do is ask. If you are a friend and you have a friend who's sick, all you need to do is pray. And our job as people who pray for the sick is simply to, to represent God, invite his spirit, and let him handle the rest. And we're to do it in love. This is going to sound funny, but it's true. Everyone who Jesus healed in his ministry eventually died. <laughs> they did. But in their encounter with Jesus, their lives were changed for eternity. And that's the opportunity we have, is to step in to represent Jesus, to pray in his name for the sick in the hopes that they will encounter his love and with expectation that our faith in partnership with the power of the Holy Spirit might see them healed. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I pray for those hearing this who feel like they are alone. And I ask, Lord, that you would by your spirit, come and fill their hearts and let them know that you are with them, that you love them. And I also ask that you would prompt them to ask for help and prompt their friends and community to reach out to them. I pray, Lord, we pray for any who feel a call, even now, maybe you've had a, a warm sensation in, in your hands. Sometimes that's a sign of God wanting to use you to pray for healing. Well, Lord, by your spirit, would you come now in power and equip them to be used by you to heal the sick, to serve, and to bless. Lord, we long to see you move in power, but even more so, we long to see your love poured into the hearts of everyone. So come and use these, your servants now, for that. 
And Lord, we pray that you would embolden us with your love, that we would have such a knowledge of your love that we would step out boldly and offer to make your presence known in the lives of those who don't yet know you. Come, Holy Spirit, move in power. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, it's been a lot of fun being here with you and look forward to seeing you again soon. Every blessing from here in Dallas.